it's, it's taken over. Right? That's just used for terrorism. Yes. And that's just used for terrorism. Yes. 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 So I'm, I'm Paul Drober, I'm President of the Mortimer History Society, I'm also a um, Principal Records Specialist at the National Archives in Kew, where I kind of specialise in 13th, 14th century British Isles, that kind of thing. Um, my own doctoral research was on the career of the Roger Mortimer, the first Earl of March, and he's the topic of my uh, two papers today. So the first half really deals with his early career, his development as a politician, his relationship with the King and the favourites, his military campaigns in Ireland and Wales, and how he came to actually be one of the main pl pillars of the kingship of Edward II. And then obviously in the second half we talk about the much more famous and notorious period where Roger, through his relationship with Queen Isabella, the Queen Mother, basically comes to rule England for about four years and we'll discuss the possibility that he was behind the murder of Edward II, how it was Edward actually murdered, and then we're also going to talk about how his acquisitiveness and greed ends up bringing him down and you know he's end up being executed and his family are put in peril. Thanks Jason. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, um, it's an honour for me obviously as president to, of the society in our anniversary year to actually be addressing you today. It feels like we're about to set on some kind of North Pole expedition. <laughs> it's like a change from like, I mean, nice to, you're all wearing the coats. Isn't it? Anyway, so over the past 10 years the Mortimer History Society has aimed to improve public knowledge of the medieval Mortimer family and the medieval March of Wales and to stimulate academic research. And hopefully some of you have already had a quick look at the journal. Now we've had some great papers already today and Catherine hopefully and I will um, continue in that vein this afternoon. Now it falls to me to reflect upon probably the most famous or infamous medieval Mortimer, Roger Mortimer, first Earl of March. Now Lord of Wigmore on the marches and of Truman Island, the traditional picture of Roger Mortimer is of a military strongman by whose rebellion and notorious love affair with the Queen he deposed the king and whose four-year rule in England witnessed terrible excesses. Now obviously he's most famous, or he has, he's been famous since Christopher Marlowe's play in the late uh, 16th, um, 16th century. Um, the troublesome reign and lamentable death of Edward II, king of England, with the tragical fall of proud Mortimer. And here you can see on the right the Derek Jarman version featuring Tilda Swinton in the, in the role of Isabel. And here we have the man himself, or the, the couple themselves, in one of Froissart's um, 14th century drawings. Now, the, the general picture is reflected in modern histories of the reign but, um, of one of England's least successful kings, Edward uh, II. Now, for those of you that were here last year, you'll have heard Professor Nigel Saul speak. And when, as a young research student, I was at first introduced to Nigel Saul, and I said who my, the, 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 man, uh, the subject of my thesis was, his response was, what, well, that awful man? <laughs> Never forget, Paul, that that man was a rotter. <laughs> now, in the past 20 years, things have changed somewhat. There's been a glut of new research on the man and the rain, notably by quite a few people in the room today, some of whom you've heard from. Um, some of the stimulus for this was, of course, Charles Hopkinson and Martin Spates, the Mortimer's Lords of the March volume in 2002. Obviously, the greatest influence on Mortimer studies is the great man himself who spoke this morning and whose work, The Greatest Traitor, has given us a more rounded, nuanced portrait of one of medieval Britain's most important individuals. Uh, several important new works on Edward, Edward II, the man and his fate, have reinforced this renewed interest. And both Catherine, who you'll hear from in a moment, and Ian's work have given us new insights into the personalities, motivations and lifestyle of the King, his Queen Isabella, and leading men of the Royal Court. They've asked challenging new questions about the evidence and historical methodology. Now, in the first part of my talk, I'm going to have a look at the early career of Roger Mortimer and suggest there is a different portrait to um, paint of Roger Mortimer than the traditional one. Just to set the scene, though, let's uh, start by introducing Edward II, King of England from 1307 to 27. Now, he's one of England's least successful monarchs. He's been pilloried by chronicle writers and modern historians. His reign not only witnessed military catastrophe, but his unwillingness to broaden the base of his council and to cling doggedly to individual favourites, uh, which brought the kingdom to civil war. Now, as Catherine's going to tell us shortly, the king's devotion to Hugh Dispenser, father and son, and their pursuit of personal gain and attempts to crush dissent 
ultimately created a coalition of the disaffected, including Edward's Queen, which brought Edward down and engineered the first deposition, or as Philip said earlier, forced abdication in English history. Now, he may also have been murdered in the months following his deposition. But, and I know this is controversial, I think Edward is probably England's greatest royal enigma. He's far more engaging and interesting a character than, say, Richard III. <laughs> you, notice, notice I'm giving this talk today and not on the 29th of June. Now, in Edward, we've got a man of the people, apparently far more at ease with his lower born subjects. He would have, um, had a passion for rustic pursuits like thatching and digging, uh, digging ditches, and an interest in engineering. Yet he was no less determined than had been his father, Edward I, to, f to defend and extend the royal prerogative and def defend the position of the crown during his reign, but with disastrous consequences. Now, I've always been fascinated by this period, and I've got my parents to blame for that. When I was about six, they bought me a Monarchs of Britain book. And like all little boys with football sticker albums, you look for the person with the same birthday as you. And fortunately for me, Edward II and I share the same birthday, the 25th of April, which is the Feast of St Mark. Uh, it's interesting, therefore, in this context, to note that Edward possibly, and I, of course, shared this feast uh, as, as his birthday with Roger Mortimer. Edward being born in 1284, Roger, it seems most likely um, an inquisition to establish his age as the heir to his father's estates is correct, in 1287. Now, unfortunately, the Feast of St Mark, as he has explored in The Greatest Traitor, was a day of some bad omens. Now, how bad those omens would prove to be, we'll come to later. Now, turning more specifically out to Roger, little is really known about his childhood. The activities, activities of his most recent forebears, as Andrew brilliantly showed us this morning, brought the Mortimer family of Wigmore to greater national prominence, and by the marriage of Edmund, Roger's father, to Margaret de Fiennes, into the royal family, Margaret being a kinswoman of the late lamented Eleanor of Castile, Queen of Edward I. Um, now, Roger inherited the castle, town, and barony of Wigmore, with the hamlets of Lenthor Earls and Starks and Lenthodine, and the manors of Kingsland, Earlsland, Pembridge, Alton, and Thornbury in Herefordshire. Other lands coming directly from his inheritance include the manors of Stratford Mortimer in Berkshire, or in Gloucestershire, Bewley in Worcestershire, and Oldcombe in Somerset, with the castle of Bridgewater. Also, a third of the manors of Long Crendon in Buckinghamshire, and Worthy Mortimer in Hampshire. Also, the Liberty uh, Manor of Cleabury Mortimer, held uh, uh, Roger being the War Steward of the County of Shropshire, from which his grandfather had extracted them out of the custody of Bridgenorth Castle. Uh, from the late 13th century, the Mortimers also claimed lordship of the lordships of Kerry and Cunnawine, with Dolphorban Castle, and the ancient Welsh commode of Grafenion. Also, the country of Mariennith, with the castles and towns of Pefentlis and Nucleus much of which had formed the Mortimers, as Philip noted in his, in his lovely chart this morning, by about 1200. Now this was, oh, yeah, this was a valuable inheritance. The Inquisition post-mortem for Roger's father, Edmund, upon his death in July 12, 1304, suggests an income of around £1,000 a year from these lands and properties, making Roger a front-ranking baron. Now the real transformation of the Mortimers of Wigmore into the upper ranks of English noble society, though, came with Roger's wedding on the 20th of September, 1301, to Joan de Joinville at Pembridge. Now, Joan was the eldest daughter and heir of Peter de Joinville, her sisters having taken the veil in Aikenbridge Priory. But the wedding put the ceremonial seal on years of negotiation between the two neighbouring families on the marches. As early as the 13th of April 1300, Edmund Mortimer had received royal licence to release to Joan's grandparents, Geoffrey de Joinville, and his wife Matilda de Lacey, £120 of lands in Stratfield and Worthy Mortimer, Cleavery and Wigmore perhaps as part of a prenuptial agreement. Now, in marriage, Joan brought Roger the Marcher Lordships of U.S. Lacey, the Herefordshire Manor of Mansell Lacey and Buffalo, and the um, Shropshire Manor of Stanton Lacey. And there we have Stanton. Now, um, she also, of course, as Andrew mentioned earlier, bought um, Roger the castle and town of Ludlow. And whereas Wigmore is the main capital of the, uh, the barony, of course, Ludlow in this period becomes it's transformed into the palatial residence of the Mortimers of Wigmore. Arguably, though, the biggest prize, and probably that which had the most impact on Roger's subsequent career, career was a claim to the wealthy <laughs> Irish liberty of Trim, about sort of 30 miles northwest of Dublin. And if you ever go there, it's a fabulous castle to visit. Um, 
trim supplement of the castle and lands at Dunhamace in County Leash, which came to Roger through his grandmother Matilda de Brose, sorry, Maud de Brose, as a share of the vast martial lordship of Leinster, partitioned in 1247, as Evan mentioned this morning. Now, taken together, the Irish element of Roger Mortimer's heritage was sufficient to become the focus of his attention during his early career. Several of his children were born in Ireland, and at a time when other major earls and barons with lands on both sides of the Irish Sea were cutting their Irish losses, this was <coughs> unusual. But we should probably view the whole inheritance, so in England, Wales, the Marches, and in Ireland, as one, as Roger would have done. Now, although different laws and customs, as well as the military situation on the ground, differed considerably between the constituent elements, Roger Mortimer, as I say, would have viewed them as one lordly whole. Sure. So Edmund Mortimer, as I say, died on the 25th of July 1304, leaving 16 or 17 year old Roger as his heir, who's still technically a minor. Now his wardship was granted almost immediately by Edward I to Piers Gaveston. Now for the young Roger, who had been raised within the household of Edward of Carnarvon, <coughs> and Edward the second as Prince of Wales, we, we know for example that Roger received a fee, a winter fee and robes for the, the year 1305-06. This brought a relationship both glamorous and of clear and present danger. Now, in some senses, Roger's connection to Piers was as influential as that to his uncle, Roger Mortimer, Lord of Chirk. Now, Piers, as many of you will know, was the confidant and possible lover of the prince. His presence at court initially, though, was as a role model and mentor for the young prince. And it's probable that Edward I's grant to Roger a season of his inheritance in England and Ireland on the 9th of April 1306 was at Piers' suggestion. However, the real motivation for his grant, with Roger was still a minor, was the campaign that Edward I was about to lead um, into Scotland. Um, taken to, oh, sorry, together with the prince and around 300 other men, Roger Mortimer was to be knighted at the lavish Feast of the Swans at Westminster on the 22nd of uh, May 1306. Now, here, Edward I attempted to bring his military community together to take on Robert Bruce, who had recently had himself crowned as King of Scots, following his murder of his rival John Comyn in the Franciscan Friary in Dumfries. Now, such a personal act of rebellion against his overlord, the King of England, a few months after Edward had executed William Wallace, former guardian of Scotland at Smithfield, reignited the decade-long Anglo-Scots War. Knighting brought the teenage Roger to national prominence and into the gaze of the ageing King, and as you can see here, it was a penetrating and withering gaze. <laughs> Now, the campaign proved swift and successful, Bruce being chased from Scotland after military setbacks and an English army again penetrated deep into Scotland. In the campaign, Roger received two tons of flour and one tonne of wine from the royal stores at Carlisle. But, on the 18th of October 1306, an enraged Edward I ordered sheriffs of numerous English counties to take the lands and goods of 22 men who had withdrawn from the army in Scotland to take part in a tournament in Flanders. Now these men, some of whom were in the royal household, and others represented leading noble families, including Roger Mortimer of Wheaton. And they had flouted the authority of Edward I to, and I quote, desert the king and his son, ostensibly for a bit of fun. So they'd gone against their promise at the Feast of the Swans to avenge the death of John Conn. To the king, these young men had contradicted his hope to bind the coming generation, including the prince, to restraining the Scots and upholding England's feudal lordship. Fortunately for Roger and most of his fellows, an intervention from Edward's a young second queen, Margaret of France, whom Edward had married in 1299, brought their redemption early in 1307. Now, such redemption, however, did not apply to Gaveston, who Edward exiled on the 26th of February 1307. And we've got to really wonder why Roger would have risked um, so much so young. And I guess there are probably two reasons. The first is the nature of the connections among the young men then at court. Now, the historian Piers Shetley famously suggested about 25 years ago that the relationship between Prince Edward and Gaveston was not sexual, as others, including some chronicles, have claimed, but that the two men had bound themselves to each other by an oath of brotherhood. I wonder whether others in their circle, including Roger, had made similar arrangements around this time. The second and most obvious is the decline of the great Edward I. The great warrior king died on campaign at Brough by Sands on the Solway west of Carlisle on the 7th of July 1307. And yes, that day, it was a lot colder than it is today. It takes a great place to go to. 
Anyway, this brought Edward of Carnarvon to the throne as Edward II, and I should in a very different era of monarchy. Now, the symbol of very essence of the change was not just the um, almost immediate recall of Piers Gaveston, but the coronation of Edward II at Westminster on the 25th of February 1308. Now, this followed only a month after the new king's wedding to Isabella of France, daughter of Philip IV. As he ascended the throne, the 23-year-old king was preceded by Gaveston, dressed ostentatiously in royal purple, according to chronicle accounts, holding Sir Edward's crown. Bearing Edward's robes on a large table, though, were Roger Mortimer of Wigmore, Edmund Fitzalan, Earl of Marigal, Lord of Clun and Oswestry, Hugh Dispenser the Younger, and Hugh de Vere. And this symbolised the transition of power to this new generation, although there remained a significant number of earls, such as Henry de Lacy, Earl of Lincoln, and Emma de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, who represented a more experienced, transi transitional body of advice for the king. None viewing the spectacle that day would have guessed how the reign would develop, and that Mortimer would ultimately bring about the deaths of Arundel and Dispenser, and be strongly implicated in the purported death of Edward II. Nonetheless, the coronation placed Mortimer in the intimate loyal circles of the king, loyalty which he would subsequently prove to Edward and Gaveston. The early months of 1308 witnessed the prospect of civil war in England. Gaveston's virtual monopoly of counsel and patronage and his ostentation alienated many of the leading men of the realm, who were determined to impose themselves on the king and assert their role as his natural counsellors as well as encourage the king to live on his own and to reduce purveyance, which is the royal right of taking goods without upfront payment. The coronation parliament at Westminster agreed that Edward should only legislate on matters passed by the magnates, and this reinforced the demands made by those who had sealed the so-called Boulogne Agreement at the time of the king's wedding in France in late January, which aimed to preserve and protect the rights of the crown by controlling alienation of royal lands and titles. <coughs> But, during early March 1308, with the king virtually friendless, several of the Boulogne signatories were ousted from the custody of royal castles. So, for example, Robert Clifford was ousted from Nottingham, John Bototor from, from Briarwoods, and they were replaced by men close to the king, including Gaveston himself at Berkhamstead, John Hordler at St Briarwoods, and Robert Kendall at Dover. And you may recall that some of these men were among those four forfeited with Roger Mortimer in 1306. So the Mortimer's uncle and nephew aligned themselves with the king too. Roger of Chirk being commissioned to go to Wales on the 17th of March to take up the chief governorship of Wales. Roger of Wigmore and Gaveston together requested a royal grant of a custody of lands on the same day. And in the preceding days, Roger had recognised a debt to the um, Frescobaldi, the king's Florentine bankers, and acquired a pardon for a man accused of murder. So his sympathies were clear. Uh, ultimately, though, the tide of opposition to the king and Gaveston proved too strong, and the favourite was exiled by Parliament. He was charged with disheriting the crown in the grant to him of the Earldom of Cornwall and raising himself to the peerage, and from withdrawing the king from his natural council, and his exile was signed on the 18th of May 1308. However, instead of sloping off to the continent, never to be seen again, Gaveston received the office of King's Lieutenant of Ireland on the 16th of June, transforming dishonour into honour. Now, not a great deal is known of the year that Gaveston spent in Ireland. English chroniclers, at a remove of time and space, claim he enjoyed a wonderful time there. Uh, now, one thing we do know, though, is that his period in office co coincided with the first of the many journeys Roger Mortimer made to Ireland to take up his wife's liberty of trip. In December 1307, the still underage under, uh, under Roger had been specially awarded his own inheritance lands. On Christmas Eve, Geoffrey de Joinville, grandfather of Joan, Roger's wife, had a license to deliver trim, which he held rather like a march of lordship, in that the king's writ didn't run there, and he tried cases involving the four royal pleas of treasure trove, rape, arson, and forestalling. And he granted those to his granddaughter and her husband. Now, initially, the couple appointed attorneys in Ireland to represent them for a year. Roger presumably hoping to stamp his lordship on his main marcher estates <laughs> and to play his full role in national politics. Eventually, around the 27th of October 1308, Roger and Joan first arrived in Ireland, and Geoffrey invested them with the Trim estates on the 16th of November. So Roger instantly became one of the leading magnates of English Ireland. And for six months, he and Gaveston were in Ireland at the same time, therefore. We can only place them together on one occasion, though, when both men witnessed a grant in Dublin on the 12th of April 1309. But we can, I think, assume that Roger received his first blooding in the more volatile warfare of Ireland in the company of Gaveston, whose military prowess won him praise from Irish chroniclers for tackling the Gaelic chief, uh, chiefs in Leinster 
rebuilding royal castles and negotiating between the rival settler communities of the English Lordship of Ireland. And this would obviously prove useful experience for Roger, whose own Lordship of Trim in the settled, prosperous hinterland of Dublin remained vulnerable. So in December 1309, Edward II ordered his Justicia and Treasurer of Ireland to draw up charters of pardon for Roger's men of Trim, who had killed a number of men uh, of, of the neighbouring Lord John Fitzthomas, Lord of Offaly, at Carberry in Kildare, who had invaded Mortimer's liberty and committed murders and other offences. The contrast with England and the marches could not be starker and required a different set of experience and skills. And for the next six years, Roger split his time between Ireland and the marches. Now, we can't place any of them precisely. Some of his elder children must have been born in Ireland, which was a true commitment to his Irish estates and a key marker of his lordly identity. Now, throughout this period, there are real difficulties, as you all know, in pinning down Roger Mortimer. We're constantly frustrated by lack of clarity in the sources over which Roger is meant, Wigmore or his uncle of Church, or even Roger Mortimer of West Wales or Roger Mortimer of wherever. Now, we do know that having returned from his first major visit to Ireland, the younger Roger received the Welsh commode of Dothor on the 26th of August 1309, four days after a royal grant of mirage for three years from his town of Ludlow. And this was a local tax on goods brought into Ludlow, which was used in repairing the town walls. And we also know that neither, uh, that neither Roger became one of the so-called Lords Ordainer, elected in March 1310 to reform the King's finances and remove evil councillors from court, amongst other demands arising from Gaveston's recall in the spring of 1309. And in fact, in the days leading up to the election of the Ordainers, Edward awarded Roger of Wigmore custody of his castle of Guelph and Roger of Chirp the custody of the castles of Blantlyfney and Berthudinus, which um, probably makes them the traitors around Gaveston who didn't assemble for the council. Uh, but probably, you'll notice I've used Braveheart a lot here, people. Sorry, it's, it's, not, it's not a great film, but it's good for uh, images. <laughs> now, probably the Roger Mortimer who journeyed north with Edward II as the ordainers deliberated in London during the late summer of 1310 to fail adequately to take on the research of Robert Bruce was Mortimer of Chirk. Though summoned, Roger of Wigmore appears to have been in Ireland. A charter in the Black Book of Wigmore, which is the family carturary recording land grants, which is now in the British Library, uh, being witnessed at Conway on the 31st of August, and an appointment of attorneys to act in England at this time. Now, the next time we can positively uh, pinpoint Roger of Wigmore is in Ireland at Easter 1312, which means he was outside England as a group of magnates brutally murdered Piers Gaveston in Warwickshire on the 19th of June. And again, it's in the context of supporting the Crown against rebellion that we find Mortimer in Ireland. So at Lent, writing had broken out in County Louth, led by Robert de Verden, a junior member of the powerful absentee family, laws to the western half of Meath, of which Roger's liberty of trim formed the eastern half. The force dispatched by the Dublin government was routed at RD and numerous captains killed. The rebels had, in a later, according to a later judicial hearing, intended to, quote, appropriate to themselves, as if by conquest, the domain lands of the king. Administering the oath of fealty as well to free tenants and beaters, who were unfree tenants of the king, as to other inhabitants of the said county, and taking homage. This wasn't a simple riot, but potentially a serious threat to royal authority in Ireland. Roger was able to broker a compromise on the ground as the leading magnate in the area. But this part of Ireland eventually became a focus for his attentions, and two of the men involved, Nicholas de Burden and Walter de la Pole, later became stewards of his liberty of trim. Finally, in 1313, Roger stood surety for those taken prisoner in Dublin Castle that they would join the King in Scotland with 40 hobbelars, sort of light cavalry, and fitting arms. Now, there's a fair chance then that those men served in the disastrous Bannockburn campaign of 1314. The same can't be said with such certainty of Roger Mortimer. Now, both he and his uncle were summoned, and we know a payment of £265 was made as oppressed on war wages in that year. Now, Warren Mortimer was definitely captured on the battlefield, the chronicler Nicholas Tribbett reporting it was that man who returned Edward's lost privy seal. Now, Ian was quite reasonably weighed up the evidence included the younger Roger was probably involved in the battle, but the sealing of a grant to his tenants in Mylianeth at Wigmore just six days before the battle might suggest otherwise, as Ian's also noted. It's not obvious um, what's going on. 
However, when the Scots ratchet up the pressure on Edward II after Bannockburn, it was definitely the younger Roger whose status, local knowledge and standing within the elite communities of England and Ireland that proved crucial in facing them down. Now on the 26th of May 1315, Edward, sole surviving brother and heir Robert Bruce, invaded Ulster. Now his, names, his aims aren't entirely clear, but as well as opening up another front to challenge the English on their western seaboard, Edward may well have been engaged in a proposed conquest of Ireland. Uh, now, within weeks, he had himself crowned and then launched a series of devastating raids on Ulster and Lath. And on the 10th of September, he defeated Richard de Burg, Earl of Ulster, Ireland's leading magnate in battle at Connor, County Antrim. Worse still, around the 6th of December, uh, Bruce defeated a large force under Roger Mortimer at Kells in Meath, leaving Dublin open to attack and forcing Roger to scurry back to England. Now, in military terms, Kells is the blot on Roger's early career and a major humiliation personally and politically. Uh, the combination, though, of Bannockburn, the Bruce invasion, the death of Gaveston and manoeuvres at court brought Edward II, politically at least, to his lowest ebb, and Mortimer returned from Ireland into a maelstrom of challenges. However, despite the defeat at Kells, he did remain one of the key figures in the Crown's fight back. So, being summoned to Parliament in Lincoln on the 17th of January 1316, Roger was to arrive in Lincoln around the 6th of February. Now, this was the Parliament that nominated Edward's cousin and main critic, Thomas Earl of Lancaster, as his chief councillor. And Lancaster clung to the ordinances and his plan to establish a committee to reform the royal household. The problem was that Lancaster was not a natural politician or administrator, and at early signs of dissent he tended to withdraw to his own lands. And indeed, the middle years of Edward's reign are characterised by factionalism. Sorry, this is the worst gag I've got coming up now. Sorry. Um, now, the preeminent early 20th century historian of this period, T.F. Tout, characterised baronial opposition to the Crown as a political party struggle with the radical Lancaster tackling the Conservative court, buttressed by a, quote, middle party of moderate magnets. Think of them like the Lib Dems or Chen Chu. <laughs> now, who aimed to use their closeness to the king to bring him to heel in his patronage and decision making? Both Mortimers had traditionally been associated with this middle party. Now, this interpretation is no longer followed, really, and historians tend to see individual personalities and motivations as dictating actions, together with the growth of the royal affinity around the person of the king. But if we look at the activities of Roger Mortimer more closely, we can, we can see what I think points to a network of relationships being forged by those with lands and interests on the fringes of English royal authority concerned at the destabilising of the Crown's position towards its periphery. So as the Lincoln Parliament convened, a serious uprising erupted in Wales. Sir Alan Bren, Welsh Lord of St Anneth, in the Lordship of Glamorgan, currently vacated by the death at Bankburn of Gilbert de Clare Earl of Gloucester, assaulted Caffili Castle and set the surrounding area to fire and sword. Now, while this was ostensibly a local dispute over Bren's eviction from office, Warner Chronicler claimed that Bren had been emboldened by the Scots' victory and aimed to rise in brotherhood with them. Now, it would be crucial, therefore, that a man like Mortimer, whose lands destroyed the Irish Sea and who had recent experience of fighting the Scots, could impart some advice and participate in the campaign. Two battalions of magnates were formed after the Parliament to assail Bren's position. One was led by the Royal Steward, William Montague, and the other by the Earl of Hereford and Roger Mortimer. Now, routed by, Montimer's, Montimer, routed by Montague's force in the Black Mountains around the 12th of March, Bren surrendered to Hereford and Mortimer near Brecon on the 18th. Mortimer received significant reward for his role, being granted a judicial commission to investigate breaches of his manors in Worcestershire and of his park at Stratfield Mortimer, and the King consenting to the enfeoffment of some of Roger's lands upon Edmund, his eldest son, an heir prior to his marriage. And here we have, I think, some of you have seen this in the flesh, one of the most important and revealing documents in Roger Mortimer's story. Now this is his confirmation of the lands with which he would dower Edmund's infant bride, Elizabeth, daughter of the Kentish knight Bartholomew Badlesmere, with whom Roger had grown up in the royal household upon the, the marriage of their children. Now this essentially private deed has some important national implications and represents an arrangement for the future of the Mortimer family. Now, it's witnessed at Kinlet in Ernwood in Shropshire by over 20 men. Some of them, like Roger Mortimer of Church and local clients Edmund Hackaloot, Robert Harley, and John Robert de Sappy, are understandable. 
Bartholomew Bands with his nephews, Henry and Bartholomew Burkhurst, and his retainers, the two Roberts de Waterville, probably represent him. But it's less easy to explain the presence of men such as William Montague and Roger Amory, two men whose favour was growing at court, or of John de Hotham, newly elected Bishop of Ely. Now these men are closely connected with the Earl of Pembroke, the leading moderate figure at court, who had been commissioned by the King to broker a truce between the Burgesses of Bristol and Battlesmere, the Constable of Bristol Castle, over jurisdictional rights in the town. Pembroke and Battlesmere were forced to press a siege, and several of the men at Kinlet joined them during the third week of July, including Mortimer, Montague, and John Charter, Lord of Paris, whose hold over his, over his own march in Lordship had been ensured by the military intervention of the Mortimers in 1312. Now, several chroniclers identify Montague, Amory, and Hugh Audley Jr. as the false traitors emerging at court who are now enjoying patronage and intimacy with the king. Now, while this might have been true a year later as their influence grew, here we have a decent number of men with lands outside England coming together to tackle threats against royal authority that could spread over broad fronts. So, Pembroke, for example, was Lord of Wexford in Ireland, while Aidley, Aidley, Audley and Amory were awaiting partition of their wives' shares of the vast Clare inheritance in England, South Wales, and Ireland. And it must be in this context, I think, and in the knowledge of Roger's recent experiences, that on the 23rd of November 1316, Edward II named him his Lieutenant of Ireland, promising him as much as £6,000 per annum as a fee. Now, with this enormous sum, he was to raise shipping and a large expeditionary force over the winter, and then pay that force for his activities once in Ireland. Though the king also granted him the forfeits of the lands of those of his tenants who had joined the Scots in Ireland. His mission also coincided with the reinstatement of Roger of Chirk as Justice of Wales, allowing sort of cross-channel connection and coordination of English military strategy. Now, no king of England had set foot in their lordship of Ireland since John in 1210. An expansion of English land holding and law across Ireland, and the establishment of central and local government had gradually been slowed by the end of the 13th century. While much of the south and east remained relatively settled, climate, the fractious nature of the settled community, and a reassertion of military and political power by Gaelic lords created multiple frontiers and authorities, weakening central power and its ability to impose its will in the localities. The Scots invasion rallied many Gaelic lords to its cause and imposed significant financial strains on Dublin in keeping men in the field and in collecting revenues. The parallel royal authority established by Edward Bruce as King of Ireland meant that Roger Mortimer could not just be sent as a justicia with its usual fee of £500. Symbolically, politically and financially, the Crown had to be seen to send a more personal representative of the absent King to bolster loyalty and lead resistance to the Scots. Belatedly, this was, I think, a real investment in defeating or at least restraining the Scots' ambitions across the British Isles. So in Easter week 1317, Roger arrived in Ireland with around 150 knights and 750 other men. He lands in the southwest just as Robert Bruce, who had joined his brother around Christmas to press the conquest, was forced to retreat back to Ulster after their campaign, which had come perilously close to taking Dublin and had reached the Shannon. Now the effects of the European famine, the failure to engage sufficient Gaelic support, and the harrying the Scots received from Edmund Butler the Justicia prevented a decisive breach of English authority in Ireland, but only just. Now, usually, the Scots' march north is seen as signalling the end of the Bruce's ambitions in Ireland, and most historians don't cover the remainder. But there remained a, a Scottish army in Ulster until October 1318, and at the time, they could plausibly have re-emerged at any moment. The 13 months Roger Mortimer spent in Ireland as lieutenant up to May 1318 ensured that if this was going to happen, the Dublin government could have dealt with it more securely. Now, as time gets me, I can only give you an overview of Mortimer's activities during this time, although I have written about this recently in two articles, one of which is most recently published in Medieval Dublin 17. Who would have thought there were 17 volumes, but there are Anyway, right. Now, essentially, Roger had to combine military force, administrative competence, and a flair for arbitration to stabilise the fragile English lordship of Ireland. You can't read that very well at all, can you? Sorry. Now, his first task was to free um, Richard de Burgh, Earl of Ulster, father-in-law of the Scottish king, whom the Dubliners had imprisoned in February following a failed ambush, uh, ambush which allowed the Scots to threaten the city. Now, this couldn't be done without due process, 
and also an offer of a pardon to the citizens of Dublin for the damage they've caused in burning and dismantling their suburbs to prevent the Scots from gaining access to the city. After discussion with the Royal Council, the Earl was freed and permitted to go to the King in England. Roger was also licensed to issue pardons for felonies as well as to grant English law to Irishmen. Now, interestingly, Roger's lieutenancy coincides with the submission to the Pope of the so-called Remonstrance of the Princes of Ireland, which complains of English oppression, both military and legal, and advocates the Scottish Lordship of Ireland. Thirdly, Roger undertook a successful campaign against his wife's kinsman, Hugh de Lacey and his brother Walter, Lord of Rathwire and Meath. So Roger exported the resources of the state to bring them to heel in court, uh, accused them of guiding the Scots through the Irish Midlands and into the Liberty of Trim, bringing their judicial exile, and then when they, the court, when they refused to go, of defeating them in the field. Military campaigns were also seen across Ireland, with Irish lords being defeated in Longford and Wicklow. And at the turn of 1318, Mortimer and Edmund Butler were able to visit Munster in the southwest, negotiating truces between rival settler dynasties of Cork and Kerry, and, albeit temporarily, bringing large, important local families back into their relationship with the English crown. Now, on the 10th of May 1318, Roger is recalled to England. Payments recorded in the Memoranda Rolls of the English Exchequer, as you can't see here, um, note that many have testified to his achievements in overcoming the enemies of the crown and repelling rebels. Now, how, is it, how important his restoration was, uh, sorry, restoration of a measure of order to Ireland and its government turned out to be, was shown in the final defeat and death of Edward Bruce at Fockett in Louth on the 14th of October by men from Louth and Meath, some of whom are known Mortimer clients. And you can see here, here's here the views of a chronicler on the effect, the positive effects Mortimer's, sorry, the, the Battle of Fockett and the English um, defeat of the Scots had in Ireland. Now you can really feel through this quote a kind of huge sigh of relief um, felt. But the job in Ireland wasn't actually finished. And about 10 months after his recall to England, on the 15th of March 1319, Roger was appointed as Justiciar of Ireland at the usual annual fee of £500. Now this amount reflected the King and his council's trust in Roger's capabilities and local knowledge. However, it also reflected Roger's connections in the group of men around the King. His recall in May 1318 came in the context of intense negotiations between the King and Lancaster to settle their simmering dispute that almost erupted into warfare on a couple of occasions. Ultimately, a settlement was sealed with a peace at Leek in Leicestershire on the 9th of August. And emerging out of the agreement was a standing council of 12 magnates <coughs> and prelates to advise the king, and a rotating four-man permanent council to remain the king. Roger Mortimer served on both councils, and it's almost certain that he used this proximity to negotiate his return to Ireland. In July 1318, shortly before the settlement, he had controversially also been awarded the wardship of the heir to the valuable earldom of Warwick, Thomas de Beauchamp, whose marriage he would exploit to his own ends, marrying him off to one of his daughters. And we might see such rewards as well deserved, indeed they are, but they may also owe as much to seeing the chance and taking it. And you, again, you can't read that unfortunately, but these are just some of the marriages of Roger Mortimer and Joan de Joinville. And it's just worth, worth pausing to note that the rich marriages Roger and Joan were able to secure for their daughters, particularly, had in some cases their germination in the early part of his career. Indeed, um, be so before returning to Ireland in May 1319, Roger attended the wedding of his eldest daughter Margaret to Thomas Barclay, another lord who had recently moved into the Mortimer orbit, having previously served the Earl of Pembroke. Now, the justiciarship of Ireland allowed Mortimer to reinforce his policies and to continue to stabilise the English lordship. Um, there's further evidence that he reached out to members of the Gaelic community who wished to enjoy the benefits of English law. And in the 1320 Dublin Parliament, he issued ordinances aimed at restraining the Scots, oh, sorry, restraining the bands of men roaming the land and of establishing a more rigorous oversight of legal and financial procedures within government. That such measures had to be repeated in subsequent parliaments over the next half century. Success peace was always a pipe dream in Ireland at this time. However, Roger Mortimer's two periods of power coincided with the extinguishing of Scottish ambitions in the, uh, in the Irish Sea world for now and a restatement of English royal lordship of Ireland. 
A month after his departure in September 1320, the citizens of Dublin petitioned the king, as we have here, um, to request a strong governor and revealing reports of Scots massing for a renewed invasion. Revealingly, and I quote, they compliment the Mortimer, sorry, the Mortimer for having thought much of saving and keeping the peace. Now this would, I suggest, be a direct appeal for his return. But Roger Mortimer would never again set foot in Ireland and would, within a year, rebel against the man with whom he'd built such a strong personal relationship of trust and service over two decades. And as I hand over to Catherine now, that was probably the tragedy of Roger Mortimer's career. Thank you.